Welcome. We're very happy to have you here with us for our coffee chat today. We have more than 600 people joining us, so thanks for being here. I'm Amy Klaus, Marketing Manager for Early Childhood Products at Brooks Publishing, and I'm very happy to have Dana Childress joining us today to talk about engaging parents in tele-intervention. Before we start, I have just a few tips for you for attending today's webinar. So up on your screen, you'll see a recommendation that if you have any other applications like email that use bandwidth, you might want to close those just for better connection. Um, if you have any questions during the chat and at the end, you can type them into the questions box in your webinar panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and if you have any computer audio issues, we recommend switching to phone call in the audio panel. It usually helps clear up some of the audio issues. The slide handouts from today's presentation are in the handout section of your webinar panel. I've also included a link in the chat box if you would rather um, download them from the internet. And they're also that link will also be in the follow-up email tomorrow. We are recording today's session. You'll get a link to the recording also in the follow-up email, as well as a link to a certificate um, in that email. So now that we've handled all the logistics, I'm going to turn it over to Dana for our presentation. So thank you for being here today. All right. Thanks so much, Amy. So I want to welcome everybody. I'm pretty dumbfounded that so many people decided to join us today. So what an honor to get a chance to talk to you guys about something super relevant right now in early childhood and early intervention, and that's tele-intervention. That's sort of the new world that we're all in, thinking about how to support families from a distance, from the other side of the video panel. So um, I'm gonna start with a, a phrase that I'm gonna click the slide to, and I want you to just sort of take it in, breathe it in, and we're gonna talk about it. All right, so here we go. I want you to just kind of think about this for a second. Think about the idea that you are not trying to engage an infant or toddler on video for 45 to 60 minutes during a virtual visit. And I'm serious, just breathe that in. Give yourself that permission and sort of that space to go, I can let go of that stress. Because in what universe could we expect a toddler, an 18 month old, a two year old, and I know some of you guys are joining who are preschool teachers, a preschooler to sit in front of a camera and play with us from a distance for 45 to 60 minutes. That's not what we're suggesting. It's not best practice. It doesn't align with the mission of early intervention. Um, so, you know, and it really isn't the way we were coaching families beforehand, right? So I want you to be able to let go of that stress that you feel like, how on earth am I going to entertain that child for my whole visit? And the, the truth is that you're not, and you're not expected to. Instead, I want to um, encourage you to think about focusing your energy and your efforts on the parent the grandparent, the caregiver, whoever is the adult on the other end of the screen. Because that's the person you are coaching before we went into tele-intervention, before um, everybody's lives shifted, um, and that's the person you're gonna continue to coach. Now, some of you may have had children in your classrooms. Um, some of you may have been seeing children in other settings, and you really were the person engaging with the child. Um, but I want you to be, I want you to absorb this idea too and think about what can you do maybe differently to give that parent a role on the other side of the camera so that that results in better um, intervention for the child and the family during this period. And then I bet it's even going to help you with your coaching skills when you go back to your normal, whatever the new normal will be. So um, I want you to try to think about that. Another important point about this here on the screen is making sure parents know this. A point of stress for parents is thinking about, oh my gosh, I have to corral my toddler um, for this period of time in front of the camera. Let families know that that's not what we're intending either. It's a, one of the best tips I can give you is set up your intervention visits, um, your interactions with the parents and the child from the get-go, making sure the parent really understands the active role and the importance of that parent's active participation. Because without them, this is really not going to work. With them, it's, it can be pretty amazing, and I'm hearing that from service providers. So what we're going to do in our the 12 minutes that I'm going to go through some strategies with you is I'm going to talk to you about some ideas for what to do before the intervention visit, some a couple of strategies for during the visit for engaging the caregiver, and then some things to think about when planning for what happens between visits. Um, do know that um, we have the questions pod open. You're welcome to ask questions. I can try to answer them after I kind of spin through the strategies. Um, we do it. There are some resources that I have a blog. The Early Intervention Strategies for Success blog is a place where we're talking about tele-intervention. 
lots of other good places for information as well. So here goes. So before the visit, and these are strategies that I've kind of collected from intervention providers and kind of combing resources, talking to people in my state and other states. These are things that they're saying are working for them. So before the visit, super important to prepare the parent. So you're going to touch base with the parent like you normally would, whether that's phone, email, text, whatever's allowed in your program. Give the parent options. Not all parents might want virtual visits, so make sure if your parents know there are other ways to connect. Encourage a hesitant parent, maybe a little hesitant with the video con like video conferencing, encourage them to just give it a try. And if they're willing, schedule a pre-visit tech check. Such a great idea. Maybe a 10 or 15 minute online meeting before the actual visit so you can talk about what device the family has, you can troubleshoot and connect to the technology, um, and you can describe what a visit is going to look like. Because families don't know what to expect. They know probably even less what to expect than you do. And I know that we're all feeling kind of vulnerable right now, just figuring this out. Even better than discussing it with them is showing them what to expect. And there are some really cool videos coming out now um, that you can access. You can send a link to the family and they can see what a tele-intervention visit looks like. Um, there's three out now that are specific to early intervention. Um, you can Google a home visit with Xander, a home visit with Aries, and a home visit with Sam, I believe is the other one. You can also find them on the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center site. They're um, created by Larry Edelman and some early interventionists in Ohio, and it's specifically on the provider and educator use of technology page. In those videos, the parents speak to the camp. The parents talk about their experience. The provider talks about the experience. The great seven or eight minute clip here and there that you can share with families so they can get an idea if this is going to work for them. I'd also include you to prepare yourself. Look at look for videos, look for resources. If you can observe someone else who's doing tele-intervention pretty successfully, ask if you can join the visit. Um, there are some trainings, some free trainings out there. And in fact, oh shoot, I had it here. There's a um, there's a resource called uh, the National Center for Hearing Assessment and Management out of Utah that has an, some free online courses about tele-intervention. So take advantage of the free stuff that's out there. I also want to encourage you to get familiar with your technology. Play around with the tool that you'll be using with families before you get on with the family, or have somebody else orient you to the tool so you can approach the visit with confidence. With that said, I absolutely think it's okay to tell the parent you're a little nervous. It's okay to share your vulnerability, but do it in a way that kind of flips the script to say, I've never done this before, but I'm really willing to try it out and work with you. And, and in that preparation for yourself and the parent, you're going to plan for troubleshooting if and when the technology goes wonky. So I'll talk about that in a minute. I also want to encourage you to prepare yourself by embracing the idea we started with. You don't need to think about how to play with that child for the hour. So put your bubbles away, put the books on your desk aside, you know, put away the toys you've maybe gathered. Put away the app you thought you were going to share on your screen because that's not what we're doing. Instead, we are coaching families so that through their interactions with their children, they know how to use strategies all the rest of the week. For those of you that are teachers who are normally working in classroom settings, I would encourage you to embrace this idea too. Spending 30 minutes or a little bit of time with the child is great, but if the parent can carry over and use strategies between the, vi between the visits or between the sessions, that's when you're going to have a win. On that pre-check, pre-tech check visit or that contact, plan with the parent for what to see and do. Try to stretch yourself to think beyond play. So play is one routine. It's a very common routine in early intervention and early childhood, but maybe there are other routines that you could join and you could see and observe and be a part of. Um, maybe there's a routine that goes really well and that you could schedule your visit to watch. Maybe there is a routine that doesn't go so well and the parent would like your feedback and you could schedule at that time. You know what, I also want you to think about like beyond play, beyond the routines, talk to the parents about how can I help you right now? What do you need and what, what kind of support can I provide? And then, so plan, because when everybody has a plan, it's a little less scary, right? But then be ready to go with the flow because flexibility is an early interventionist superpower. So use it, be ready to follow, go wherever things go. Another tip for planning for what to do is ask the parent, what would you be doing if our visit wasn't scheduled at this time? And then follow it up with, can I watch that? Can I join it? Can I, can I help you through that? And maybe we could find some places to embed some strategies. <laughs> All right, so that's some tips for before the visit. Let's think about what to do during the visit. 
So during the visit, um, I really want you to, to think about starting how you would have normally started, and that's with a check-in. Right now, that's especially relevant to check in about family's well-being. Do talk about progress and all the other stuff you normally would have, but just see how they're doing. What do they need right now? How is life when the parent now is trying to work from home, manage the older children's school work, because a lot of us are doing that, plus take care of an infant or toddler or preschooler. So just check in for that emotional check-in because that's really important. Um, I also encourage you to revisit the IFSP outcomes and find out what is relevant in the current situation because life has changed. New things may have bubbled up that weren't originally on the IFSP that might be more important to address right now, and that's okay. I want you to also think about your perspective and embrace the idea that you are joining, the way you're providing support and the way you're joining the visit and the routines is through your voice. And this is hard when many of us are used to joining through our bodies. We were physically present. We were modeling things with the child. We were walking around with the parent and working through strategies. And now you, are, you might feel limited by your voice, but you can use your voice as an empathetic, supportive um, voice on the other end of the screen. You can use your voice at, in a friendly, supportive way to coach the parent through activities. Um, your voice is still powerful. You just need to be thinking about what you're saying and how you're saying it, being gentle with your suggestions, but specific in your guidance. With all that said, I want you to go into the visit, keeping your focus on the parent who facilitates learning for the child. It's good coaching and it's best practice in the eye. So if you were joining this visit here with this fantastic dad and his twins, because you're not, you don't have, maybe you couldn't go at breakfast in the past, but now you could schedule your visit and observe breakfast time, and because you are not a body that's physically present, you aren't going to be changing the interactions just by your presence. So how cool is that? You might get to see routines and activities and interactions you didn't have access to. So approach the visits with some openness because there's some great opportunities there. When you're actually in that visit, I want to encourage you to put your observation hat on. It's going to be even even bigger hat than maybe you were wearing before. Observation is your friend right now. Good observation, looking for functional skills, scanning the environment is really how you're going to provide that support now. A great strategy is to use is the show me prompt. So you might be talking to the parent and she's talking about her weekend and she mentions gardening and we had a lot of time, fun in the garden but he kept falling over when he was trying to participate. Because maybe balance and coordination or something you're working on. Now you can say, well, would you mind showing me what the gardening looked like? If you don't mind taking me along, picking up the device and taking me outside, I would love to see and maybe we can problem solve and work together. So you don't need to be a static face on the other end of a screen. Encourage the parent to take you along. You might Again, you might get to see routines you didn't get to before. Another great strategy with the observation is scanning the environment. You might see off in the corner, um, a toy that you know that child loves to play with. And if, especially if there's a little dead space in the video, you can prompt for some kind of a playful interaction. Um, you might see other things in the environment that you could use if you're working with an infant or toddler on some positioning. Maybe you see a rolled up towel, a rolled up blanket somewhere and you could ask the parent, what do you think about trying that? So you're gonna use your resources um, in a different way, but scan and see what you can use. Always ask for permission and make space for the family to say no, because that's okay too. Um, I want to encourage you to be descriptive and specific in your guidance and feedback. When you use your voice, you may feel a little more directive, but remember you are not telling families what to do. You are supporting them through coaching, through collaboration, and through reflective problem solving where you might ask the parent, what do you think about that? Why do you think he did that? What could we do differently in this situation to support his development toward whatever the goal is? Help the parent think it through, help the parent use what's in the environment. And I'm telling you, this situation could be providing opportunities for us, as a friend of mine said, to stretch your coaching muscles, so embrace it. With all that said, you're gonna also need to breathe, stay calm, and accept that there will be technology hiccups. I mean, that is just the truth. It, things, people are gonna freeze in funny positions on the screen. The audio is gonna drop. Uh, somebody will get bumped out of the Zoom room or whatever platform you're using. I love the idea of having a troubleshooting plan with the family during that preparation, right? So if somebody drops out, the screen freezes, stay online for another minute or two because it might unfreeze and come back. Let the family know that you will call or text whatever's permitted in your program because you can always re reconnect by phone. 
Um, and worst case scenario, if, if it's just not a technology day, if it's really going wonky, you cancel. You just can't do what you can't do. So give yourself permission to get out of it and then get back into it. If you have the flexibility, jump back in in 10 minutes. Reschedule for another day. I'm hearing providers saying they've got a lot more flexibility now that they're not traveling all over the city and county. So just breathe and stay calm. Use your sense of humor and know that you're learning, the family's learning, and you, you get a do-over. If the tech fails or if the visit didn't go as well as you want, you have flexibility. You can try it again next time. So give yourself that space and that permission in the family as well. Some strategies for flexibility. If, if visits aren't feeling like they're working or you're worried about it, um, you can always try things like um, changing the time of day or the day of the week that you scheduled. Maybe you have a little more flexibility because you're not traveling and you might get to see a routine you didn't have access to before. You might shorten the length of your visit. So if your visit is an hour long, but maybe instead do two 30 minute visits in a week while everybody's getting used to this new platform and way of interacting. Check with your programs to make sure that's okay, but I'm hearing folks trying that out and finding it successful, especially as families are feeling a little more and more comfortable over time. If you're okay with it, invite the siblings in, invite others in, whoever's in the home. It doesn't just have to be you and the parent and the child. You might see some cool stuff there. Um, and again, like I said, be flexible in the routines and activities you approach because you might have an open window here to some things you didn't see before. So that's during the visit. Let's think about some things for after the visit. So after the visit, I want to encourage you to um, invite the parents' feedback. That could happen at the end of the visit or during, you know, between visits. Send a quick text or email or check in. Ask, how did that feel to you? Check in on the feeling part of it. How did it go? How did it feel? What did you like? And ask the parent, what could we do differently next time to make this better? I'm a big fan of the joint planning. You guys know if you're doing coaching, you will be ending your session with a joint plan where you and the parent have agreed on what the parent chooses to do next between visits, and you agree on what you wanna plan for the next visit. I love the idea of writing it down. So right now, just send a quick email or text to the parent so they have that written record. It's also a way to touch base and connect between visits. Here's the joint plan. Here's what you know you wanted to do between visits. Let me know how it's going. And another great strategy I've heard folks saying is they're using video check-ins. So encourage the parents, send me a quick video between the visits when you use that strategy. Let me know how it goes. And then that you can review that before the next visit, or you could get online with the parent, share your screen, watch that two minute video clip together and process it and problem solve in the moment. This can also be, this video can be a useful strategy for families that aren't sure they want to jump into virtual visits. Maybe just sending and receiving video clips and support around those clips could be an option. Um, it also could be an option if you have families that, you know, you're a little worried about it, how, how that engagement's going to go. And taking advantage of videos that they might already be sending to grandparents might, might just be a foot in the door. So my final strategy, and I, I want to um, kind of wrap up my part here today with a final strategy to encourage you to practice patience. Um, I want to encourage you to, we, we are, it's much easier for us to practice patience for families. We often, we say we meet them where they are. We, you, we approach them with sort of kindness and sort of a generosity to accept where they are, help them through what they need help with and provide that support. But I also want you to practice patience for yourself, sort of cultivate that idea that you're learning. What do they say? Somebody told me recently, you're flying the plane while you're building it, but you're also, um, you're, it's okay if you stumble, like give yourself a little space or you might leave a visit and go, whew, that did not go the way I wanted, but that's okay. Pick yourself up, jot down some plans for next time, touch base with the parent, reach out to other providers. You might feel kind of alone in your home right now where you're you know, sheltering in place. Reach out to others, ask if you can observe their visits, ask for support when you're stumbling and have a sense of humor. When it all said and done, laugh it off, you're learning, next time will be better, I promise. So I hope this has been helpful for you. Um, I did put my email at the bottom. Um, if there's any questions I can answer, if I can be a support to you, I am more than happy to do that. Because um, I kind of, you know, everybody says we're all in this together. Well, in the early intervention world, we're a small world and we really are in this together. So if there's something I can do to help you um, in the meantime, know that I'm here and I'm happy to. So that's it for me, Amy. I'm gonna turn it back over to you.
Thank you so much, Dana. That was really helpful. Um, we have some good questions that already came in, but before we take those questions, I'm just we're going to go over a couple more slides. So the good news is um, that three people listening today are going to get a copy of uh, Dana's book, Family Centered Early Intervention. So we're going to randomly select three attendees and we'll ship the book to you. We'll contact you and ship the book after the webinar. We're also giving all listeners a 20% discount. So on the next slide, there is a cough, the code Coffee Talk. If you're interested in any um, any resources, there's a 20% discount through the end of June. Um, we also have more Coffee Talk chats. Um, so please feel free to check our website. Um, we're adding, we're doing about two to three every week. So please join us for future ones. And also we wanted to let all listeners know we have a um, COVID-19 resources page where we've gathered some professional development events, recorded webinars, um, downloaded resources, some activity handouts that you might want to share with parents. Um, so we encourage you to check that out too. So now um, we'll go into some questions. So if you have any questions, type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar bar. Um, Dana, we had lots of um, people asking about the resources you mentioned at the very beginning of the webinar. Um, so if you could go maybe just talk a little bit more about those. Um, I told listeners we'll send some links out in the follow-up email. They wanted the um, the early intervention, the blog, your strategy blog. Okay, yes. Yeah, so, um... Yeah, I could probably use easiest to send the links out, but the blog that I write is called Early Intervention Strategies for Success. So if you Google it, it usually does come up. Um, I can try to give you the URL. It's V as in Virginia, V E I T dot org slash early intervention. So can you, um, I'm typing into the chat box now for people. It's V E I P D P D dot org dot org slash early intervention slash early intervention okay so i put that yeah. url in the chat box so hopefully everyone Perfect. can see that and we'll follow up also in your follow-up email um you mentioned a institute the national center for hearing in utah could you um confirm that the name of that center for some yeah, it's a long one um it's the national center for hearing assessment and management Okay, I'll type that into for hearing assessment and management. Okay. Yeah, they have three free courses on talent intervention on their site, and I actually haven't personally taken them. I'm not associated with that association or anything, but I know their resources and hey, free resources are awesome. So check check them out. The videos, yeah. if you guys wanted to know the videos, really the hub for talent intervention stuff um, around early intervention, early childhood special education is on the Early Childhood Technical Assistance Center site. So I'd encourage anybody to go for that. There's links to all this stuff there. And so the videos that I mentioned, links to those um, those free courses are on there. That's that's really where we're, everything's kind of being collected. So a great place to go. Our site right. too, Amy, Virginia Early Intervention Professional Development Center site, we okay. have a COVID-19 and tele-intervention page and you can access it from our homepage. Um, so that's another place to go where we're linking to things like this. Great. Thank you for going over that. And so I'll, um, we'll send some of those links out in the follow-up email. I'll confirm them with Dana. Okay. Um, let's see. So we have um, some other questions that have come in. So, well, we have some recommendations or some comments from other listeners that I think are interesting. Um, one home visitor mentioned that she thinks it's really helpful that people use a device you can move with, so like a phone or a tablet, as opposed to like a laptop, because little kids move fast and it's helpful. That's a fantastic idea, and I forgot to mention, I've heard providers say, talk to the parents about where you, where that laptop or, or the device should be positioned, so that you kind of get ahead of time where, where we're going to aim it, how the parent's going to prop it up, those kind of things, so that you, it's a little less time troubleshooting on the visit. You can do that on the pre-tech check. Um, we have a listener who's commenting that most of her families only want telephone sessions and it's challenging because she's never met the kids. And so she's mm. relying just on the audio and the parent report. Do you have any guidance for, I guess, encouraging people to participate in video? Yeah, that's, that's challenging. I guess without knowing the reason the families are choosing to telephone, you know, that's probably what I would want to know is why she thinks 
you know, they're more comfortable with the phone. Sometimes it might, if you've never met them before too, you might have to spend a little time building some rapport with the family by phone before they're comfortable, kind of opening up their home to you on video. Cause I think that sometimes can be the scary thing is I'm gonna allow video into my home and I don't know this person. Um, I, one of the things that I've heard people is if you can encourage the family just to try it once, even for 10 minutes, could we try getting online and meeting by video one time um, and making sure the family understands the expectations ahead of time. Like I said, that the parent doesn't have to have the child standing right there the whole time because parents might know there's no way I'm going to accomplish that. So I'm not even going to try the video. Um, so those are kind of things I would suggest to get closer, even maybe sending one of those video links so the family can see what to expect. If you do have to stick with phone, um, you know, that's okay. You might talk about, talk to the parent about if they would be interested in sending you video clips of some of the things the child's doing, and then you can talk the parent through what you've seen and some ideas to help address it. Um, I, everything is so emotional and so hard right now with so many families juggling so much. Wi-Fi is stretched in families' homes. I think we just have to go with where they're comfortable. And, and hopefully with building that rapport and that providing that support over time, maybe the video visits would be an option later. Just keep checking in with the family regularly in case they change their mind. Yes, thank you. Um, take another question. Uh, do you do any games, play any games specifically to get all the family members watching your tele, telelearning engaged? I don't know. I haven't thought about that. I, I I think is everybody was engaged, the parents, and this might be a something for older kids. I think you could try that as long as you could, you could help the family could would be able to split their attention, I guess, between the game and your coaching and your support. I, so I, I don't want to say no, because I haven't done it. Um, I would, I would hesitate if you were trying to pull up an app that the child was going to get really drawn into and maybe the child wouldn't be able to attend to the parent that parent child interaction because that's not really in line with what we what we want to see you know in early intervention so you know I think I think give it a shot and see but just remember your goal your goal is to really support the caregivers interaction with the child and to carry that off when you're not there so that's another thing to think about if it's a cool game that only you have access to or they only have access to on your session that you really have to think about how is what they're going to learn going to be relevant when they don't have that game later. So give it a try, but think think long term about how what the impact that could have and how you can stretch the strategies so that the family can use them between visits. Thank you. We're getting lots of nice comments, so nice thank yous and how this was all helpful information. So oh, thank good. you for sharing this, that feedback. Um, we have a listener is asking, how would you handle it if a child is watching TV at the time of the visit? Oh, the dreaded TV question. Somebody was going to throw it at me. That's a that's one. I think I think I would go back to the preparation and the planning. If that's something you can address and talk to the fan, the parent about ahead of time, um, that would be a great idea. I think, and I and you know that if the family is you know if there's an activity or routine that you can observe that doesn't involve the TV, then maybe you can plan for that ahead of time. You know, I think you have to address it the same way you would address it if you were there face to face. I'm not personally a fan of asking families to turn off TVs because the TV is going to go right back on when you're not there or the video visit isn't on. Um, so I think I would see, sort of seize that time to chat with the parent about what they've been doing, how that what the what the child's been learning, how they've been interacting. You know, if you get really creative, maybe there's a way to use the TV as a tool. I remember helping a child learn some intentional communication by turning, we had the parent turn the TV on and off and he had to request it to go back on and request what cartoon he wanted. So if you can use it as a tool, I think um, that's a helpful thing. Um, and you just kind of coach the parent on how to entice that child into some other type of an interaction, knowing that the TV could just be background noise in the family's life. So I hear you, it's a tricky situation, um, but it, it's also gonna be something to have a chat with the parent about re-explaining re what the purpose of our interaction is and how the ask, you know, kind of question with the family, is the TV helping us get where we wanna go? If not, what are some other options? Makes sense. We're getting some nice other um, tips from listeners. So one listener says, when I send my email invite, I ask for the child to bring something to show me when we do the ah. visit. That gets the little one excited to come talk and show me their toy or animal. What a fantastic idea. I'm totally going to steal that one. I'm going <laughs> to on a blog. That's a great idea because it gives the child a role and it also gives the parent a role to help the child be ready. So I love that idea. 
and another listener is saying it's been helpful for her to have both parents or two involved involved in the session because sometimes the child's getting into things and then it helps to have one person who's kind of helping with the child and one person who can talk. You know, that's a great idea. I also heard somebody say they had both parents logged in on their phones separately, which was actually really cool because she could see the child from different perspectives. Then they were working on a motor or some motor things. So, you know, that's pretty creative if you have access to both parents who may be home right now. Take advantage of it. Um, we have two listeners who had questions about um, little kids who are just really interested in the phone itself and want they what do you recommend if they just really want to get to the phone rather than let the parent kind of talk on it? Yeah, you know, I think I would, that's a hard one because kids are so drawn. The, the good thing is, is sometimes they might be a little less drawn to you than they might be to the app that they're looking for in the phone. Um, if the parent has the option to use a different device than the phone, sometimes that can be helpful. If, I know we had a before to not use the laptop or the desktop computer but if there's another option that's one way to handle that i think i would ask the parent what does the parent already do now to draw the child's attention away from the phone sometimes that is i put it in my back pocket or i turn it off which you can't do right now um, but again that kind of planning ahead of time is there some other activity or something that child really likes that we could help shift his attention Maybe it's picking that phone up and leading the child outside into the backyard, which is probably, hopefully, more, more fun than just staring at the phone. Um, so, I think, you know, all, another thing you can do is try to scan the environment and give the parents some suggestions. There Maybe there are some other things to try in the environment that we could draw that child in. Even things like, instead of trying to get the child to play and the child doesn't want to play with anything other than the phone, could, you know, if the parent's going to go prepare a snack, could we pull the child into that preparation activity that doesn't involve the phone? I've also heard of intervention providers encouraging families to put, to place the device up out of the child's reach. So if there's a way to place that um, up or back or somewhere that the child isn't able to sort of climb up and get to it, eventually, you know, if, if you're having a good coaching session, hopefully the child that child's attention will be diverted away from that device. It's challenging though when kids are used to being plugged in a lot. So I hear you. Yeah. Um, do you recommend that programs have parents sign a consent form to participate in a video visit? I think that's really up to programs. I know some states are saying yes. Some states like my own in Virginia are um, taking, vid uh, taking verbal consent and documenting that in the child's record. Um, but that verbal consent has to come after they've really, the family has really been offered the options, explained how video visits would work, um, ex explained the privacy issues and the sort of the inherent privacy issues in using, you know, using apps, using unsecured devices. So you still need to explain all that stuff. I think it's um, really up to your program guidance um, and state guidance. So I would kind of lean back on that. I don't have a recommendation necessarily one way or the other as far as signing a form, but I do think it's a good idea to document that the family was comfortable giving it a try. Great, thank you. Um, um, just, sorry, um, you earlier you were talking about sharing video clips in between visits, and we had some listeners who were asking how, how if there was a specific way you recommended doing that, like a certain platform or um, to, to share those videos? Hmm, I, I mean, if your program is if your program is allowed to do text and email, I suppose you could just text the clip if it was short. You know, we wouldn't. It'd be a lot harder to check text a ten minute bath time routine versus a two minute you know interaction. Um, I, I, again, I think I would lean towards checking with your program requirements in case there are prefer preferences. Like I know there are preferred platforms for the video conferencing, so just in case there's something that needs to be encrypted or non encrypted for sharing that kind of things with families. Um, I know in our state we aren't allowed to share videos like by Facebook Live. Anything that's that's public facing we can't use. So I would I would check with your supervisors on that. I would keep it as informal as possible. I mean there are you know there certainly are resources for file sharing like Google and Dropbox and all that kind of stuff. One question I guess I would have is ask the family how do they already share videos with relatives and friends? And maybe there's a resource that they're using that you can tap into. But keep it as informal as possible because I just think that the lower stress everybody is under right now, the better. Right. Um, let's see. 
we had another, let's see, a listener um, who is sharing another tip. And they're saying um, mm -hmm. during their telehealth videos with families, they observe how the parent interacts with kids during mealtime and playtime. Some kids gets really some kids get really excited and interactive during mealtime and attempt to share with us over video. <laughs> and it can lead to more conversation with the child and food can be really really motivating for kids. I think mealtime is like our second favorite routine past playtime in early intervention because th sometimes the kids are kind of corralled, which is nice. You know, you can kind of watch and see what happens without a lot of running and you know, in and out of the frame. So I think that's a fantastic idea. And you could even ask families that, is it okay if I, you know, join you for lunchtime next week or whatever. Um, sometimes having a specific routine like that can take a little bit of the pressure off families who are like, I don't know what we're supposed to do because I'm on the other side of the camera. So I love that idea of joining something that's already existing. There's a great video that's linked to our website. Um, that shows it's I don't it's a put out by someone named Lynn Shea so I don't know her anything was just on YouTube but it's a great video that shows an, a tele intervention visit where the she's following the parent who's doing laundry with her toddler so they just set the phone up in the laundry room and they're going you know putting the clothes in and out so sometimes that real routines based approach can be very cool for everybody having something to do and you seeing some fantastic interactions great um, we did get a question about doing a virtual screening with ASQ come in, so I wanted to let all listeners know um, that Brooks did record a webinar on how to do virtual screenings with ASQ3. So if you go to the agesandstages.com website in the news item, it's the first link. And so we have a whole page with a recorded webinar, there was a recorded Q&A. And there's even, um, you can access JPEG files to text to families. Um, if you can't get them print questionnaires right now and you can do it in an interview format. So um, I highly encourage you to check that out if you're using ASQ with um, with in home visits. That's um, fantastic. Uh, oh, we have one listener who said they've been loving having sessions with dads. Um, yeah. And do you feel it's different to coach a mom or a dad? Or both together now, I guess. Probably. I mean, I think it's probably dad's got a different perception, you know, of the child. I, you know, I don't know if I would plunk them in different categories necessarily, but um, it was my experience that dads, you know, and there's a little bit of research too, you know, that dads typically like more physical play. They might be into more of the rough housing and moving, running around in the backyard. So that might be a cool opportunity that maybe you hadn't had with the mother, not to say moms don't like all those things too, um, but the differences between how dads interact with their infants, toddlers, preschoolers, again, could offer you some pretty cool uh, opportunities. I would check in with the dad first ahead of time, let him know, especially if he hadn't been present or whichever parent hadn't been present for visits with you before, touch base, make, you know, kind of lay the groundwork for how it typically goes, ask the dad what he would like to do, um, you know, just kind of, spend a little to lay the foundation for how the coaching is going to work especially if that parent hasn't done it before but i don't i think it's fantastic if you can involve the other parent that's not present because what a what a great opportunity great all right well thank you so much dana we really appreciate all of your um time and sharing your expertise with us we had lots of um lots of really nice comments from listeners so thank you so much um thank and you. we'll I'm so glad. We'll send out a lot of the links that um, Dana talked about to, to the blog and to some of the, um, the the example videos showing televisit. So we'll send that out tomorrow. So you'll get your email. It'll come out tomorrow afternoon. And as I mentioned, that'll have a link to your certificate. And it'll also have a link to the recording. And you're welcome to share that with colleagues who maybe couldn't join us. Um, so thank you to everyone for joining us. And thank you again, Dana. We really appreciate it. Thank you. It's been fun. And I got a few new strategies too. So I, it's a win-win. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Great. Have a great rest of your day, everyone.